Let's open in our Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 7, as we continue our study through the Old Testament. In chapter 6, we were introduced to this man named Gideon, and you remember that the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he said, you're a mighty man of valor, and he's like, me? Me? (laughs) <laughs> that's how we are sometimes right he's like i'm from the smallest family i'm from a poor family how in the world's god gonna use me you know uh but we saw the lord speak to him and call him saying that he's gonna use him to deliver them out of the hand of the midianites um of course he had the word of god but then he put out a fleece you remember and he said the first night okay lord i ask if this is really you that the fleece would be wet and the ground would be dry in the morning Well, in the morning he comes out and it's all wet and the ground is dry. He goes, well, maybe, Lord, don't get mad at me, but let's try this a second time. Let's do it opposite. How about this time the ground is wet and the fleece is dry? You know, God is so gracious that sometimes he'll condescend to us to come to our level, even though we have his word, but we test, don't we? And we want the Lord to confirm these things, but uh, he did. He confirmed it to him. So now we pick up the story in chapter 7. Then Jerubbaal, that's the name that was given to him, because uh, I don't know if you remember, but back in chapter 6, that the Lord told him, I want you to get rid of the idols in your house. And he got rid of the idol of Baal in the middle of the night. And of course, it stirred up this whole thing. And so his dad stood up for him, and uh, but it was a test of of. Gideon's faith, but they renamed him Jerubbaal, like the one who's, uh, let's see, what does it mean again? Uh, I have it written down here. It means uh, the Baal fighter, or let Baal argue. So he's the, the Baal fighter, and uh, you see that in chapter 6, verse 32. You know, therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbaal, the Baal fighter saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down the altar. So that's his name, his nickname. So as you get to chapter 7, this is still Gideon. Then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, he tells you again there, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. Now, this is the Jezreel Valley. This is like kind of in the north. Uh, It's a main valley that goes through the land of Israel. And you notice there the host of the Midianites on the north. He doesn't tell you right here, but if you flip ahead to chapter 8, verse 10, he tells you how many Midianites there are at the very end of that verse. Well, let's see, there was 15,000 men, all that were left of the host of the children of the east, of the Midianites, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. So there's 135,000 Midianites. Men. That's a big army, right? That's a big battle. So there to the north. So here's Gideon. He, he has the word of the Lord. It's been confirmed to him that he, the Lord's going to use him to deliver them out of the hand of the Midianites. He's the judge that God is raising up. Well, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand have saved me. Uh, We're going to see that, uh, you know, there's like 32,000 men of the Israelites versus 135,000 Midianites. And the Lord's like, that's too many. Wait, what? Too many? And he tells them why. Because even against those odds, they would still take the credit if they win. (laughs) Isn't that how we are sometimes? You know, I know it's just me, but, you know, a little old me. But, you know, if, if this happens, then, you know, maybe there's something special about me, you know. Uh, but nope, there's too many less. And God is so gracious that he's like, I'm not going to let them take the credit. So in verse three, he says, now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, 
Let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And their return of the people, 22,000, and there remain 10,000. Okay, so here's the first reduction. And here's the qualification. If you're fearful or afraid, go home. How many went home? Most of the army. <laughs> 22,000. 10,000 are left. Why do you think the Lord told them that? Why do you think the Lord wants them to get rid of those that are fearful? We'll go over to Deuteronomy. Turn over, hold your finger here. Go to Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. He told them in the law something that when you go into battle, here's something to observe. Deuteronomy 20, verse 8. And the officers shall speak further to the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Right? Because fear is contagious. You got someone in the battle with you, but they're afraid. You might start to get afraid. So first thing, he says, all right, first of all, Send all those home that are fearful and trembling. And that was most of the army, 22,000. There remained 10,000. So now we pick up back Judges 7, verse 4. Here's a second reduction now. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are yet too many. Still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will try them for you there. I'm going to test them. And it shall be that of whom I say to you, this shall go with thee, and the same shall, the same shall go with thee. And of whomso, whomsoever I say to thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So the Lord's saying, I'm going to tell you who it is when you get there. Have them drink water. Uh, bring them down to the water. So he brought down the people to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth. Right, you get the picture there. You know, what does a dog do? They get their face in the dish and they're licking it with their tongue. So anybody who's bending down, licking it with their tongue, the water, as a dog lappeth, him shall you set by himself. So set them in one crowd. Likewise, everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, right? So they're bringing it from the water up to their mouth, from their hand. He says, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down their knees to drink water. So you get the two groups of people. I mean, they all had to bow down to get the water. But there was ones who were sticking their face in the water. God said, set them aside. And the other ones who were going to pull it up to their mouth. Well, there was only 300 who did that. So verse 7, the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men <laughs> that lapped, will I save you. And deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took vittles or, uh, you know, their provisions, their food in their hand and their trumpets, their shofars. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath them in the valley. So again, how many Midianites are there at this point? 135,000. And the Lord dwindles down first from 32,000 down to 10,000 because those guys are fearful. Then he says, that's still too many. All those that bent over to put their face in the water then were how many? Whatever 10,000 minus 300 is. So, you know, 9,700. This quick math, you know, I'm not usually that good at math, but <laughs> so that he sent them back to their tent and kept the 300 to go against 135,000. Those are not good odds, naturally. Would you agree with me on that? <laughs> so the first reduction, get rid of those that looking at the enemy are going to be fearful, gripped with fear. Second reduction I think it's those that have kind of a lack of urgency, right? Those that are putting the water down, they're, they're looking around, they're, they're observing, you know, they're not afraid. Where people that are putting their face in the ground, you know, of course, 
that's just an interpretation. I mean, Gil Irwin, he was one of my favorite Bible teachers. He's, uh, he's retired from ministry now. But he said that he thinks that the ones that couldn't bend down all the way to put their face in the water, it's because they were too fat that they couldn't get down. And isn't that like God to use people that just, you know, the most unlikely, right? So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which is the case. But, you know, I kind of look at it as don't allow the fearful and trembling and don't allow those who have a lack of urgency, right? They, God wanted men who had a sense of urgency in the battle. Amen. They're watching. They're alert, right, when, when they're facing danger. Um, I think there are men today that live their lives as if no war is going on. There's a lot of men in the church today who are not engaged in the battle, right? They, there's no urgency to pray. There's no urgency to strengthen themselves in the word. Uh, they don't feel an urgency to get the gospel out to the world. There's no urgency towards missions. And God's like, all right, those are the ones on the shelf. Those are the ones not being used. But here's the 300. And what kind of men does God look for in the battle? Those that are fearless and those that are alert. Amen. And they're strong. And maybe fat. <laughs> yeah. Men who have a sense of urgency about, you know, uh, the day and the age. Really, that's how we are. You know, we want to be men and women of urgency in the battle. We're living in desperate days. So verses 9 through 14, now he's going to spy out the Midianite camp. It came to pass the same night, the Lord said to him, Arise. Get thee down to the host. So go down to the army, for I have delivered it into your hand. But, now he's talking to Gideon. He says, but if you fear to go down, go with you. Go thou with uh, Fura, or Pura, however you say it, thy servant down to the host. So take this guy with you, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards shall your hands be strengthened to go down to the host. Right, so the Lord gives him a little encouragement. Hey, Gideon, if you're a little bit afraid, if you're a little scared, go down there and take your friend with you, and you're going to see something that's going to strengthen your faith. So what does Gideon do? Then went he down with Furah. So he, what does that show you about Gideon? He's afraid. So just because somebody is a leader doesn't mean they're not necessarily afraid. Um, but isn't it interesting that God sent all the guys home who were afraid, except Gideon. Because Gideon's a mighty man of valor, even though he's not quite there yet. The Lord knows that that's what he's going to be. Well, he went down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east, so here's this confederation, right? They lay along in the valley <laughs> like grasshoppers for multitude. I mean, it looks like this whole swarm of locusts or grasshoppers. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Don't you love how the Lord sets things up sometimes? He's setting it up to show that it is impossible for them to take the credit. I mean, Gideon's looking at the army like, man, there's so many camels, I can't even count them. More than the sand of the sea. You know, and, and the multitude, we're like, they're, they're like this whole group of grasshoppers for multitude. Verse 13, when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream to his fellow. So here's one of the soldiers talking to the other guy and said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled in the host of Midian. You know, a little bit of barley bread, like poor man's food, nothing. You know, came into the camp of the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. I mean, it just came and wiped out this tent. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. So there's this dream. Gideon's eavesdropping. He hears the interpretation of the dream. Oh, that's the sword of Gideon. He's probably thinking, how did this guy hear about me? 
you know, except that he's just this from the small family. But this, somehow this guy has the interpretation of this dream. So verse 15, and so it was, it was so, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped. You know, he just got on his face and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. See, now his faith is built up. He's been testing the Lord, asking for signs, has the word of the Lord. Finally, the Lord's like, if you're scared, go down. I'll give you one more help. That's how the Lord is, though. He condescends to us. He helps us in our weaknesses. Was it the right thing that he was afraid? He shouldn't have been afraid because he had the word of God. But God still, in his love and his mercy and grace, you know, condescended down. And I just love that about the Lord. That even in our weaknesses, he knows our frame. He knows we're but dust, you know, and he just, he helps us anyway. So he just falls on his face before the Lord, tells him, arise, the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men. I mean, these must be some, you know, manly men, right? I mean, they're not afraid. 300 against 135,000? That, to me, shows their faith because they're willing to go against all odds to obey the Lord. Those are the kind of guys I want to go to battle with, you know, and those are the guys that I appreciate. So he divided the 300 men into three companies, so 100 each, and he put a trumpet, a shofar, in every man's hand, so he passed out 300 shofars, with empty pitchers and lamps Within the pitchers. So he's holding, they're holding these little pitchers, uh, little bowls, and they're putting the lamp inside of it, probably kind of covering the light because it's going to be dark, and you'll see what his plan is here. And he said to them, look on me and do likewise. All right, guys, follow my example. This is what I want you to do. Behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. You're like, you guys copy what I'm doing. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, so my, my group of 100, then you blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of Jehovah and of Gideon. So Gideon and the 100 men that were with him came to the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Now, the first watch, it was 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. The second watch was 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And then you had the third watch, which was 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So the second watch, that, that time between 10 and 2, 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., at the beginning of it, so we're talking 10 o'clock at night, right, when it's like the darkest, getting darkest in the middle of the night. And they had but newly set the watch, Right, so here come the guards for the meeting. They're, they're changing the guard at that time. So their eyes aren't quite adjusted yet to the dark and all that. And so th- he sets them up. They blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Like So 300 people smashing it. And three, the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers. Whoop, dropped my phone. And the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. Thank you. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now you're talking psychological warfare. It's dark. These guys, their eyes aren't adjusted yet. They're all blowing shofar. You know? They throw the pitchers on. Everything's breaking. Then they see all the lights, the candles, and they're surrounded. They're thinking, uh-oh, like we're outnumbered. So what happens? Verse 21. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fled. 135,000 people. Like this is chaos, right? <laughs> this is, oh man. I just, I would have loved to see this. They need to make a movie about this. And the 300 blew the trumpets 
And the Lord, I love this, the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. I mean, they're all confused because the Lord now is having everybody do the civil war happening. And the host fled to Beshita in Zerath and to the border of Abel Mehola unto Taboth. So they flee. They actually at this point now cross the Jordan River to the east side. So now they're in the Transjordan area. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, and out of Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim. So here's some of the tribes now getting involved, right? Naphtali, Asher, Manasseh, they pursue after them. But Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Now, you might want to underline Bethbara and write in your margin John 1, verse 28. You want to turn over there real quick, too? Are you write that down. John 1, 28. This is just a fun little geography uh, trivia, Bible trivia, but... This is pretty cool. This is when John the Baptist was baptizing. And you remember Jesus got baptized. Or he was going to be baptized. But where was John baptizing? Yep, but look at verse 28. These things were done in Bethbara beyond Jordan. Bethbara, that, it means the place of the ford. This is where John was baptizing in the future, but this is where Ephraim went down to Beth Bara, Jordan, to take control so that the Midianites don't get away. So they're blocking them in so that they can't flee. So that was just a little Bible trivia for you, Beth Bara. So if you ever get to, we ever get to go to Israel, we'll, we'll find this place and we'll point it out to you. So back to Judges 7.25. And they took two princes, so... The tribe of Ephraim, they block it. They took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Oreb, his name means raven. Zeb means wolf. They're kind of scary dudes, right? That guy's a raven. That guy's a wolf, right? And they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, which... Evidently was named after they killed him. They commemorated it by calling it the Rock Oreb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb. So that place got named after him too because he got killed there. And pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So Ephraim catches these two guys. These are the princes, the kings. They take their heads. And deliver him to Gideon. Wow. So that happened at Beth Bara. So there you go. Later on Jesus gets baptized there. But now you get to chapter 8. And the men of Ephraim said to him. Why have you served us thus? Like why have you done this? That you did not call us. When you went to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide with him sharply. So. The Ephraimites get upset with Gideon. How come you didn't call us to go down and fight until later? Like, why are you having us come be just reinforcements? Why didn't you call us to come down? And he said to them, what have I done now in comparison of you? <laughs> Gideon gets real diplomatic here. Well, what did I do really compared to you guys? <laughs> Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer, basically what he's saying is, you know, the little bit that you guys got was better than anything I got or I did. You guys got the heads of the kings. So that's not really, I mean, really a few grapes, that's better than having the whole vineyard and not having as much impact. It's basically he's buttering them up, basically. You guys did the main thing there, getting the kings. 
God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. <laughs> so they're like, all right, you're, you know. And I think here's a perfect example of Proverbs 15, verse uh, 1, where it says that a soft answer turns away wrath. <laughs> Sometimes in wisdom, you just need to, you know, not fight with people, just give them a soft answer and make it kind of just calm down, you know. And that's what Gideon did. Well, verse 4, Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. So now he's on the east side, right? The Transjordan part. He and the 300 men that were with him, faint, yet pursuing. So they're tired. They've been battling. But they're still following. They're still pursuing. And isn't that something? Not one of them died? That's crazy, huh? That's so that the Lord gets all the glory for it. Well, he said to the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me. For they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zamuna, kings of Midian. So here's the, the kings of Midian you know, that are there, Zeba and Zamuna. So he's asking them for help. Can you guys feed my guys? Can you feed my army? And the princes of Sukkoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? And if you're taking notes, Zeba means, uh, uh, can't even read my own writing now. <laughs> Slay, oh, my eyes are, I'm getting old, guys. Let me zoom in on this, sorry. I had it in my notes, but. Slay or sacrifice. That's it. <laughs> Let me see what Zamuna means. How do I get up in there? Shade or phantom. So again, those are kind of crazy names, right? Go get slay or slaughter and phantom, shade. I'm gonna... But they're asking him, so do you guys have these guys in custody yet? Because they're wanting to know, hey, if you guys don't win, I don't want to make them upset in case they come back and destroy us after so do you guys have them in custody so that you know that we should give bread to your army and Gideon said therefore when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand don't you like that faith when not if he says then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars wow in other words I'm going to thresh you guys like we thresh wheat i'm going to put you on the rocks and run you over basically I'm, it's going to be a pretty gnarly you know death so that's the judgment that he's saying is going to happen to them because of their their mockery basically not helping them so verse 8 and he went up there to penuel and spoke to them likewise and the men of penuel answered him as the men of sukkoth had answered him you know, do you have these guys in custody? Uh, are you sure we should help you? And he spoke also unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come into, again in peace, I will break down this tower. In other words, their stronghold. This tower that was a stronghold for them to help protect them. He's like, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get rid of your tower. Since you guys aren't helping us. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor, so this is about 100 miles east of the Dead Sea. So they've traveled pretty far. So, you know, the Jordan River is between the land, and there's the Dead Sea at the bottom of the Jordan River. Well, from the Dead Sea, about 100 miles east is this place, Karkor. And their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, you know, this, that whole confederation, there's only 15,000 left. For there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. 300 took out 120,000 men. And really it's because the Lord had them have a civil war, you know. But they're still pursuing after them. And they're still hungry and they're tired, but they're still going. But these other cities aren't helping them out, are they? When Gideon went up 
by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. So they thought, really. <laughs> so again, 300 against 15,000 now. That's still not good odds. Well, they're, they're hiding. And when Zeba and Zamuna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zamuna, and discomfited them. Or literally, he terrified them. Wouldn't you be terrified? We saw this guy and his army take out so many people. And there was already rumors, you know, from the dream and all this stuff that had happened. They're terrified. And Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up. And he caught a young man of the men of Sukkot. So he, he goes back to that city. And he catches one of the young men and inquired of him. So he's asking him questions. And he described to him the princes of Sukkoth and the elders thereof, even 77 men. So you, you picture it. He comes back to the city, catches the young guy and goes, hey man, who, who are the elders of this city? Who are the ones in charge? And he described to him these 77 men who are the elders, the leaders of the city. And he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom you did abraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to the men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city, and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkah. He taught them. He sure taught them a painful lesson, doesn't he? This is a, a, a painful object lesson. Because he, he kills them. This is what happens when you don't help the servants of the Lord, is what he's basically saying. You're not willing to jump in and help you know, the people of God? All right, here's your punishment. And, verse 17, he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. So he wipes them out too. That's pretty gnarly, isn't it? Then said he to Zeba and Zamuna, What manner of men were they whom you slew at Tabor? So evidently these guys there at Mount Tabor, he killed, they killed some guys, some men in that area. And he says, What manner of men were they? And they answered, As you are, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. In other words, they looked like royalty. And he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if you had saved them alive, I wouldn't slay you. Like if you would have spared them, I wouldn't kill you right now. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, so this is Gideon's son, get up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. So Gideon, he's got the right as a avenger of blood because they killed his family. So he's got the right. So he wants, I think, train up his young son, his teenager probably, this young man, and says, okay, I want you to, to take the right and I want you to do it. And he's like, no, nah, I can't do it, Dad. I'm too young. I'm too afraid. I haven't killed anybody yet, you know. Then... Zeba and Zamuna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. And you know, I think one reason too Gideon wanted his son to do it was because that would be so shameful for these two kings to be killed by a youth. He's not even a man of war. He's not even a, he's just a kid. So they're like, Rise, fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. So they're actually kind of provoking. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Um, this word ornaments or the crescents, literally, uh, these were like crescent-shaped jewelry that they had. Uh, so they were like moon-shaped ornaments, and we kind of know that too from Isaiah 3, uh, verse 10 or 18, I can't remember, but in Isaiah, it mentions this, uses the same word. 
So he just kills them, takes their stuff. Verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, for you have delivered us from the hand of, the Midian, of Midian. So basically, they're asking him, we want you to be our king. And we'll let it go down to your sons and your son's sons. You rule over us. Be our king. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. In other words, no. We're not going to have a monarchy. We're a theocracy. Right? We know what a democracy is. It's where people vote. It's the rule of the people. Right? Democracy. Theos, God, theocracy, God ruled instead of people ruled. So God, at this time, even with Moses, with Joshua, now with the judges, it's a theocracy. The Lord is ruling. He doesn't want there to be a king at this point. Now eventually, he'll appoint a king. He intended David to be the king. Saul ends up becoming the first king because of the people. Uh, when you get to 1 Samuel, they talk about that. But Gideon's like, no, I'm not going to rule over you. My son's not going to rule over you. The Lord, Jehovah, shall rule over you. And Gideon said to them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they got a lot of the spoils. It was gold. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast there in every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand 700 shekels of gold. That's a lot of gold. That's heavy. Beside the ornaments and collars and the uh, purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camel's necks. So they're giving him all kinds of stuff. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went there a whoring after it. Which thing became a snare to Gideon and to his house. So Gideon kind of makes this quasi-priestly ephod. Uh, we're not exactly sure what it looked like. Um, some scholars speculate that he probably made it to look like the high priest's ephod. You know, with all the gold and everything. And what happened though is that it kind of became a monument where now people are coming from all over Israel to kind of worship this object because look what Gideon did. So it's kind of, Gideon's, he's kind of a mixed bag. Like he's a mighty man of valor. The Lord raised him up and used him and he's right in saying, I'm not going to be your king. The Lord's going to rule over you. But then he kind of does something foolish here and, and makes this almost kind of like a monument where people are coming to worship it. He already destroyed an idol in his house, Baal, but now there's this other thing now of worship and it becomes a snare unto him and to his house. Verse 28. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more. You know, after this, the Midianites aren't a problem for Israel. They don't lift up their heads anymore. You don't hear about them throughout the rest of history. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. Right, so here's that pattern, right? They fall into idolatry. God raises up a judge to deliver them. They come back to the Lord. Then everything's fine while the judge is alive, except with Gideon, there is a little compromise and that they're coming to worship the ephod. And it's a snare to him. But at least there's no war. It's quiet for 40 years. You know, when you get to chapter 9, you see that one of his sons, though, does assume a throne. He tries to become a king, and it causes all kinds of problems. But uh, verse 29, this speaks now the judgeship of Gideon. And Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had three score and ten, or seventy sons, 
of his body begotten. So he's got 70 sons, for he had many wives. That is a lot of kids. I, Christmas, Thanksgiving, I mean, that would get crazy. Hopefully all their kids aren't in December like mine, you know. Like, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? And January 2nd, might as well be December, right, Say. Si? And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Now this is where it's going to get tricky in chapter 9. The name Abimelech means my father is king. Here's a compromise because he said, I'm not going to be your king and my sons aren't going to be your king. But he names his kid, my father is king. Because notice, he called him Abimelech. Not, not her, he did. Isn't that interesting? It's a kind of a compromise there. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead... Notice that qualifier, as soon as he was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Bel, uh, how you say that? Baal Barith their God. And that's going to come up in chapter 9, verse 46. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed to Israel. So they don't even treat his family right. But isn't it interesting how fast people go back to idolatry? Yep. You know, sadly, we see this in churches, too, sometimes. You have, you know, a, a man who God raised up, used him, you know, in just a wonderful way just beautiful you know ministry but as soon as he's gone then all of a sudden people just kind of scatter and you know fall away because it's almost like their hope was in that guy rather than in the lord you know um but how often do people all of a sudden you know say a leader falls not even just dying say a leader falls people just their whole faith is gone, right? And they go back to the world. They go back to idolatry. But I think one of the lessons with Gideon, I think a couple of lessons. One is you can't put your faith in a man. They Be our king. He's like, nope, the Lord's going to rule over you. He did have some compromises. He wasn't perfect. No leaders are perfect. But you don't want to put your eyes on a man. Amen. Secondly, I love the principle that God doesn't need a lot of people to get his work done it reminds me of Jonathan and the armor bearer remember he's like you know God can save us by many or by few it doesn't matter to the Lord let's go up if, if this happens the Lord's given them into our hands and they went up to two of them by faith took out the army right and they fled you don't need to have a lot of people and I think the Lord chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise because then he gets all the credit he doesn't choose the mighty he doesn't choose those that are noble you know like paul told the corinthians but god chooses the foolish things because then he gets all the credit and uh god has his ways of dwindling down the army so it doesn't matter if there's a few or if there's many it really doesn't matter what matters is that the Lord is ruling. Amen. I want to be on the Lord's side. Amen. How about you? You want to follow the Lord? Let's follow him together by faith. Amen. Let's not be fearful. Let's have a sense of urgency. And I think in that sense of urgency and being in the battle, we need to be men and women of prayer. We need to be men and women that are going to share the gospel and be bold for the Lord. Because... We don't have much time. We're in the last days. I mean, look at what's happening all throughout our country right now with all these uh, protests against Israel and, you know, pro Hamas. I mean, it's a crazy time. And if ever there's a time to be bold and to stand up, now's the time. 
Lord, we thank you for Gideon and his example. Lord, even though he wasn't perfect, that encourages me because you don't just use perfect people. You equip and raise up people that you can work with. So, Lord, help us just to be people that are pliable and teachable and that we can um, really just trust you by faith, Lord, following you and your promises and your word. Fill us with the Holy Spirit tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.